Good evening. Uh, our lecture today named uh, Bleeding Disorder and Monitoring of Anticoagulant Therapy by Fatma Abdel Wahab, lecturer of clinical and chemical pathology. Well, this slide shows that there are uh, three types or three main causes of bleeding. Uh, bleeding due to vascular uh, defect, bleeding due to coagulation defect, bleeding due to platelet uh, defects. To differentiate the cause of bleeding, first, we should uh, ask ourselves some questions. What is the onset of uh, bleeding? Uh, is this sense purse? Is this acquired? Is it a congenital? It will differ. Then, we ca could ask about family history as some recessive disorders run in families. Uh, could ask about the bleeding history, uh, acute or chronic bleeding. We should ask on the pattern of bleeding. What is the pattern of bleeding? Is it ecchymosis, petechiae, mucosal or feces bleeding, uh, bleeding from wounds, bleeding, uh, and uh, relation to the onset of trauma? Is it bleeding spontaneous or in trauma? This slide are taken from a pediatric source, so it's mined mainly by uh, congenital causes, but it could differentiate congenital or acquired causes, but, but we could, uh, it could uh, give a hint to differentiate uh, some types of bleeding. Here are uh, an example of ecchymosis versus petechiae. Usually ecchymosis are usually due to the coagulation factor defects. Petechiae are usually due to the platelet defect. Uh, it's not a, a strict uh, it's not a strict um, differentiation as some sort of uh, severe uh, case uh, example of DIC, it can have both coagulopathy, uh, coagulation factor effect, and platelet defect. It's, uh, in real life, it is not well 100% uh, uh, demarcated, but it gives us some history, yani some, um, some tips and hacks to identify this bleeding. Uh, usually, PTK only found in platelets and sometimes on vascular bleeding, but uh, ecchymosis can be on coagulation factor or in severe cases of bleeding due to uh, platelet defects. In bleeding due to platelet defects, we have two main types, the thrombocytopenia or the thrombocytopathy. The thrombocytopenia is verified. Uh, you have another lecture before that one of our colleagues will differentiate uh, causes of thrombocytopenia. But some cases having a good platelet count or an adequate platelet count was bleeding, it is called platelet dysfunction, either, either also congenital or acquired. As you have a, a, a previous detailed lecture, uh, one of our colleagues will give uh, to you called thrombocytopenia or platelet count disorders. I will go uh, rapidly through these causes. When I'm having thrombocytopenia in my patient, I have three main types. First, to decrease the production. Second, to increase the distraction or the abnormal pooling. One example of abnormal pooling is the hyperspirinism, which was called uh, sequestration, platelet sequestration. Uh, the diminished production, it can be due to bone marrow ablesia, bone marrow suppression, either idiopathic or uh, post viral post infection, or uh, marrow infiltration, or marrow replacement, uh, um, either, uh, either in uh, pediatric or in adult. 
uh, the marrow can be infiltrated by storage disease, for example, in pediatric or by aneuplastic or a metabolic disease in, uh, uh, in general. Uh, such as leukemia, lymphoma, sarcoid, uh, marrow fibrosis, whatever the cause, that the marrow cannot manufacture platelets. There is a hypo uh, this production of hypo production and some cause of MDS also. Yeah? There is a diminished production of platelets and macrocytes, or there is an increased distraction. The most common cause in pediatric is the ITP, or in adult also. Uh, immune, uh, primary immune or uh, secondary immune to other autoimmune diseases. Uh, also, uh, destruction can be uh, through hemophagocytosis, through um, um, yeah, through um, the AV malformation as the Casper Marit syndrome or uh, presence on uh, uh, the microangiopathic hemolytic anemias or in the IC that the platelets are destructed mechanically mechanical destruction or immune destruction or some drugs or infection or etc etc to summarize here this slide summarizes the most common causes of bleeding due to vascular defect or vessel defect some causes are hereditary connective tissue disease or hereditary neurangiectasia or acquired due to severe infections or hinoxorline purpura drugs etc the coagulation factor defect either hereditary as hemophilia A factor A deficiency, hemophilia B factor 9 deficiency, or uh, other coagulation factor defects, uh, they are quite rare. Also, the, due to von Willebrand disease or acquired defect in coagulation factors such as liver uh, dysfunction, uh, anticoagulant overdose, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, and some, uh, as we mentioned before, some uh, platelet defects in the thrombocytopenia and the thrombocytopathy. This is a nice slide also. We cannot uh, uh, run through. You are a clinician and you face the, the, the patient before the lab. What do you expect in your patient? You have a platelet dysfunction, coagulation, uh, platelet defect uh, or vascular defect or combined defect. As we see, some cases of uh, liver dysfunction having a thrombocytopenia also having a increased plane hyperspirinism or also can have a acquired coagulation factor deficiency. In real cases, you may find uh, combined causes to cause bleeding. But some cases you can, by examination, uh, differentiate uh, the primary hemostatic defect here we can uh, we can uh, consider that they are the vascular and the platelet uh, the link between platelet and coagulation factor um, through the von Willebrand, uh, von Willebrand factors wherever the second hemostatic uh, occurred by activation of the coagulation cascade and so the site of bleeding can differentiate. The bleeding is minor or major, ecchymosis, hemarthrosis, bleeding to trauma or spontaneous bleeding, and some examples of bleeding. Uh, it's a repetition. Uh, in my lectures, I try to repeat the knowledge uh, in different uh, methods to illustrate more common examples or more examples in real life. Here, that, uh, there is two, two main types of platelet dysfunction. The congenital platelet dysfunction, which is present since birth or since early infancy or since early childhood, or, 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 etc. Or it's acquired. Uh, one of the most common causes, uh, I don't know statistics, uh, but uh, we must differentiate. Some cases of congenital platelet dysfunction cannot uh, cannot be um, clinically uh, evidence except after uh, menorrhagia, uh, the, except after um, uh, yeah, puberty in females, or except after uh, the need for a major surgery. Some cases of congenital platelet dysfunction may pass unnoticed till late, uh, late childhood or early adulthood.
the acquired causes we cannot miss the anti platelet drug uh, effect um, so all, almost all cases of atherosclerotic patient are on regular anti platelet drugs uh, in some cases um, there is an overdose or in some cases there is uh, some sort of drug interaction we may face a, a bleeding due to overdose of anti platelet drugs um, that should uh, be considered uh, that if you if your patient of regular antiplatelet drug will go a minor minor surgery as tooth extraction example or a minor uh, intervention you should uh, you should protect your patient from bleeding or anticipate bleeding through those modification uh, till the procedure overcome in some cases we we have uh, met uh, in blood banks for platelet uh, infusion was uh, the anti platelet drug overdose and and so the platelet dysfunction almost uh, they are congenital but acquired causes cannot be missed uh, platelet dysfunction acquired can be seen also in uremic patient in toxic uh, uremic uh, toxin in patient of chronic renal failure the platelets uh, also are dysfunction and so the, our lecture is not confined to platelet, but you shouldn't ignore an acquired platelet dysfunction as a cause of bleeding. This diagram is a sample. This diagram is a sample illustration of the coagulation cascade. First, how to prevent bleeding? Whereas I have a vascular vascular uh, role in the prevention of bleeding almost due to injury, the first thing to occur is the vasoconstriction, then the exposure of the subendothelial cells or subendothelial matrix and the activation of platelet occurs simultaneously. And then after platelet adhesion and platelet block formation, there is a coagulation uh, activation to uh, prevent bleeding at the, vas at the site of injury. There are two main pathways for coagulation system activation. The extrinsic pathway, which is composed of mainly of the tissue factor, which is factor 7, when it's activated by the exposure of the subendothelial uh, sub matrix or the peri perivascular adventitious exposure causes activation of factor 7. The activated factor 7 here directly activates directly activate factor 10 which subsequent activate factor uh, 5 and subsequent activation of factor 2 in the common pathway the ext extrinsic which is called the extrinsic pathway the extrinsic pathway composed mainly of the activated factor 7 where is the contact activation or the intrinsic pathway composed mainly of activated factor 11 then factor 12 then to activate the cofactor factor 8 in, and factor 9 then the activation of the common pathway here uh, we can so we can see that some coagulation factor uh, numbers are missed as factor 6 is not uh, um, numerically is not present uh, factor 4 it's not uh, mentioned but this it's a calcium uh, in real life we calcium cannot be a cause of bleeding as the um, the minimum uh, yeah, the amount of calcium in blood even in the hypoglycemic patient are sufficient for activation of coagulation system you will not find a patient that will have a coagulation effect due to calcium uh, some tips here then the common pathway activated the common pathway here is a, a factor 10 and factor 5 factor 2 and factor 1 what's common the common pathway here again uh, we are investigating a cause of bleeding and 
I have I should have a history I should have a platelet count I should have uh, an examination then I should consider to test the coagulation system as we mentioned in the previous slides I have the extrinsic pathway mainly co composed of factor 7 and the intrinsic pathway mainly composed of the contact factor activation factor 11, 12, factor 9, factor 8. Then we have a common pathway that both factors, both coagulation pathways are led to the factor 10 activation followed by factor 5, then the prothrombin activation to make thrombin, and then thrombin activate fibrinogen to fibrin and cause the fibrin clot formation. Here, this slide shows that when I'm testing the extrinsic pathway, I'm testing by PT, the prothrombin time. When I'm testing the intrinsic pathway, I'm testing through the activated partial thromboplastin time. Here, when I have a PT, I am testing the extrinsic and the common pathway. When I'm having a PTT, I'm testing the entrancing and the common pathway. Example written, the PT evaluate the coagulation factor 7 and the common. What, what are the common pathway? In the same order, 10, 5, 2, and 1. And here we are testing in the extrinsic, uh, extrinsic pathway and the common pathway. Then I'm in a APTT, the activated partial thromboplasting time, you are testing the contact factor, factor 11, factor 12, factor 8, and factor 9, then also the common pathway. This will uh, give us some hint in the next table that I am uh, going through. So, if I am having a prolonged PT only, what does this mean? If I'm having a prolonged PT with a normal PTT, what does this mean? This means that the common pathway is not affected. And the, if the common pathway is affected, I will have a prolonged PT and PTT. And hence, when I'm having a prolonged PT, I am testing factor 7, which is more common in use. Factor 7 is one of the vitamin K dependent factors. We will go through the antioxidant and uh, say it again as it is one of the vitamin K dependent factors. I am testing the vitamin K antagonist through the PT. Here, if I am having a prolonged PT only, that means I have a factor 7 deficiency and early anticoagulant therapy. So, if I am having a prolonged PTT only, with normal PT, that means also that my common pathway is not affected, which is more common is the hemophilia, hemophilia A and B, and some cases of antiphospholipid syndrome. Also, the von Willebrand factor deficiency having a prolonged PTT, as von Willebrand is essential or, or crucial in activation of factor eight. Hence, only PT or only PTT is prolonged. The third common, the third, the third. What I'm having, if I'm having post prolonged PT and PTT, here I'm having a common pathway defect. Why common? As only if I have an extrinsic only, I will have a normal PTT. And if I have an intrinsic only, I will have a normal PTT. Both are prolonged and hence we are having defect in this patient in common pathway is a factor 10, factor 5, factor 2, and fibrinogen. Uh, factor 2 and factor 10 and factor uh, um, the common pathway are one of vitamin uh, K dependent factors. We um, previously we could uh, we could uh, sign them in 1972, 1972 once. 1972, fibrinogen, factor 9, factor 7, and factor 2. In late in anticoagulant therapy, I'm having prolonged PT and PTT. In acquired uh, or congenital defects in factor 5 or factor 10, I'm having prolonged PT and PTT. But if 
I have a prolonged PT and PTT, can I differentiate between fibrinogen defect and other common pathway? Yes, through the thrombin time. Thrombin time, I am having uh, to test the if I'm adding thrombin to my sample, the thrombin will allow fibrinogen to give fibrin. So if I'm deficient in fibrinogen, I will have defect in or prolongation in thrombin time. Yes. For this reason, I can differentiate the common pathway from fibrinogen deficiency. Last option, what I have if I'm having a prolonged bleeding prolonged bleeding time or prolonged uh, platelet function, uh, function analyzer and some in vitro uh, uh, testing of uh, the bleeding through platelet function analyzer automated. I, I don't see the, uh, its routine in Egypt, but uh, you can read about it. Uh, it's equivalent to PT, if I, uh, bleeding time. If I am having a prolonged bleeding time as well as abnormal coagulation defect, you can uh, see if voluntary plant disease, if I'm having bleeding time only prolongation, bleeding time with normal coagulation, I'm dealing with a platelet defect. Well, this nice algorithm, uh, having uh, almost the all causes of bleeding in one algorithm and in one uh, slide. How to proceed in a case of bleeding? Screen by CBC, PT, PTT, bleeding time or as we mentioned, platelet factor analyze, platelet function analyze. If I'm having both prolonged PT and PTT, and with PT only or PTT only or both, uh, any prolonged PT or PTT, how to measure if I, uh, how to proceed if I don't know the cause from history, as I may know the cause that the patient on my patient on uh, warfarin therapy, and I'm expecting that uh, early I have a prolonged PT and late I would have a prolonged PT and PTT. What if I didn't know the cause and there is a prolonged PT or PTT or even thrombin time? I am doing a mixing study. What's meant by mixing study? Mixing study is that I mix my patient sample to a normal known uh, sample of plasma. Uh, that normal sample will Correct the defect in coagulation factor will supply the sam will supply the patient sample with a deficient factor and then the prolongation will be shortened. It's called mixing stuff. What if my sample of prolonged PT and PTT did not correct, uh, did not shorten by uh, did not shorten by addition of normal plasma? Normally, if I'm having a normal factor, I'm having normal PT and PTT. Top. If I have a defect factor, I will have a prolonged PT or PTT or both. This factor is deficiency or dysfunction, deficiency or inhibitor, deficiency or other cause. So I am supplying my patient sample with a normal coagulation factor. And if the correction occurred through the mixing study, it's a factor deficiency. If it is not corrected, it's some sort of inhibitor. We'll go through again. Then. If I am having a problem in the platelet, platelet morphology and macroplatelet, thrombocytopathy, uh, macrothrombocytopenia, I am having a clue to that there is a platelet defect. And in this case, also I will have a normal coagulation profile. But what if I am having abnormal coagulation? Plus platelet. Some case of thrombin bank was not the main issue in our uh, lecture today. Having a thrombocytopenia with larger platelet and having a prolonged PT. But uh, mainly, mainly, I will uh, discover the thrombin bank by a prolonged PT. Bleeding time. Bleeding time. Bleeding time. Bleeding time. In some cases of bleeding, I have tested the intrinsic factors and the extrinsic factors and the common pathway. I have tested the platelet. I have tested for wound brain. I had tested for platelet dysfunction, and I didn't. I don't find any abnormality. Here we had the suspicion of factor 13. Factor 13 calls the fibrin 
stabilizing agent after activation of the whole coagulation system ending by formation of a fibrin polymers activating fibrinogen to fibrin and then making polymers this fibrin uh, are slightly fragile it should be cross-linked and stabilized it's occurred due to factor 13 activation factor 13 activation uh, causing a firm clot formation what I'm having deficiency in factor 13 almost rare but I should consider if it's almost rare that I have a normal coagulation ending by fibrin clot but this friable and degraded easily so I have this factor 13 again and again we can see here the importance of mixing studies the importance of mixing studies that if I am corrected with a prolonged PCT I am corrected due to factor deficiency if what if I am having no correction what's meant by correction that I am adding a normal plasma to the deficient plasma or the patient plasma and the PT is not corrected the PTT is not correct that means that the prolongation is not due to deficiency of the factor as I'm adding normal factor and no shortening of bleeding time uh, of uh, PT and PTT occurs so that effect is uh, due to inhibitors what meant of inhibitors the most common inhibitor or the most uh, famous inhibitor is the lupus anticoagulant in the antiphospholipid syndrome we will go through again in the lecture uh, here the, the re repeated causes okay. as our lecture reminded by the monitoring of anticoagulant therapy we just uh, the prescription of anticoagulant therapy is not the lab uh, procedure but uh, you the clinician the internal medicine or the pediatrician or the cardiovascular or the cardiologist uh, etc or even the rheumatologist you will face a patient with hypercoagulopathy or a patient that you need to uh, give him an anticoagulant uh, there are some cases of uh, uh, examples of uh, anticoagulant indication. Here we can uh, say the coagulation cascade system. What I'm if I need to anticoagulate? I am having some different anticoagulant modalities of three. Either I'm using the heparin, either the unfractionized or the molecular, low molecular weight heparin, or the vitamin K antagonist, or the direct thrombin inhibitor, or the activated factor 10 inhibitors. Here, the diagram show or illustrate how I prevent coagulation or do anticoagulation through interaction of the coagulation system. That's why. Here, I am saying that factor uh, seven and factor nine and factor ten and factor two are the vitamin K dependent factors. So the vitamin K inhibitors such as warfarin antagonize the effect of these factor, the activation of these factors. Heparin, heparin act through the dark box here. Heparin act through the um, prevention of activation factor 7, factor 12, factor 11, factor 9. Also, uh, here I can see, I can see here a box or a narrow box, a factor 10, and a box also on factor 2. So the heparin acts through 
thrombin and activated factor 10, activated factor 7, activated factor uh, 9, 12, and 11. Uh, here I can see that the heparin mode of action is not minor, it's not minor by our lecture, but I am here to conclude that my patient or heparin may have a prolonged PT. PTT. Uh, my patient on heparin may have a prolongation of both PT and PTT. My patient on anticoagulant warfarin may have a prolongation PT or a prolonged PT and PTT. What are uh, if my patient using direct thrombin inhibitors, it will act on activation thrombin, will prevent activation of thrombin. What if my patient have a direct factor activated factor 10 inhibitor will act through activation of factor 10. Some, um, it's not a 100% discrimination that uh, not exclusive that the heparin causes and then um, uh, other antiagonin causes may, uh, different antiagonin may share some properties to prevent uh, coagulation or doing anticoagulation may have some properties to each other. Here, this table sums the differentiation between the vitamin K antagonist, unfractionized heparin, and low molecular weight heparin uh, through the mode of administration, the half life, the duration of therapy, and monitoring required. How to monitor this patient and why I'm needing to monitor? Definitely, we need to monitor the vitamin K antagonist. Uh, not definite, not in all cases. I I should monitor the unfractionized heparin and the low molecular weight heparin. And why to monitor? This slides also demonstrate how to monitor. What test I should use to monitor? By warfarin, I should monitor by INR. By heparin, I should monitor by PTT. Some reagents are sensitive to heparin and some reagents are not. We should consider this. In low molecular weight heparin, I should monitor through the anti-factor, activated factor 10, uh, the abixaban and rivaroxaban, and uh, activated factor 10 inhibitor or the direct thrombin inhibitor. I should use the proper test to monitor the desired drug. This slide show what uh, the desired cause, uh, the desired INR uh, figure uh, in cases uh, on warfarin side. The desired INR should be from two to three, according to the coordination decision and according to the patient condition. What if I found that my INR uh, of the patient is below 1.5? So I must increase the dose. What if I found my uh, patient 1.6 and 1.9? I should increase the dose. Uh, exceeding 3, I should decrease the dose. Exceeding 4, I should hold the treatment and reverse uh, the INR uh, till it reach uh, decreasing the dose. How to tailor? It's dynamic. It's not a figure. I cannot describe a single dose for every patient. Every patient has its own uh, metabolism, its own response to treatment, its own drug interaction, and some cases having other comorbidities and other drugs. And hence, I should monitor my patient closely and I should have an action through the INR result. As we mentioned before, there are different types of anticoagulants. Here, this schedule allows to differentiate between both. Uh, not the lab uh, choice to have the anticoagulant in the clinician choice depending on the pharmacokinetics of this anticoagulant and the desired anticoagulant uh, duration, the desired anticoagulant therapy uh, purpose. Um, 
I should uh, how to should monitor and what's the advantage and disadvantage. It's so uh, purely clinical and more uh, of the lab to choose.